Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is cloud computing. So there are multiple uses of the term cloud computing. And so you need to be a little bit careful and think about who you're talking to and what they might mean when they're talking about cloud computing. In its basic usage, cloud computing or the cloud is just referring to anything that's up on the network. So I could be referring to a file server, a mail server, or a media server. So if I say something like, when I take a photo on my iPhone, the photo is stored or uploaded to the cloud, that is completely accurate. It's going up on the internet somewhere. Or if I say, I back up my critical documents to the cloud by storing them on Dropbox, that is also entirely accurate. However, when I'm talking about cloud computing in a business situation, particularly if I'm talking about a tech company, and we're talking about using the cloud, this will often mean we're replacing computers that were previously physically present at the company site with remote computers that are either partly or completely managed by someone else. And so under the traditional model, we manage and store our own computers on our own premises. We're responsible for security, we're responsible for providing power to them, we're responsible for controlling the network both within those computers, uh, interconnecting those computers, and connecting us to the wider internet. And again, under the traditional model, if we need more computers, we order those computers. Um, it takes them a while to arrive. They arrive. Uh, they're delivered to our site. We need to set them up. We need to get them on the network. We need to make sure everything's working properly. And under the traditional model, again, if uh, there are updates or security patches issued for um, software or the operating system that our computers are using, we need to make sure that this is taken care of. We are responsible for all the security. Now, uh, in order to understand how the traditional model differs from cloud computing, I'm going to take a look at two uh, very closely related early models of how cloud computing might work. And so you can kind of view this as a vision of the future of where things are headed. And most, but not all of the things that we're going to see in these models are uh, available now. Um, so two, two, again, closely related models of cloud computing that, that people came up with were utility computing and grid computing. And so the term utility computing comes from the concept of a public utility, such as water or electricity and grid computing. Uh, the name grid comes from the concept of the electric grid. If you think about how the water system works or how the electric grid, grid works, I have certain interactions with them and certain expectations on what I do need to do when I'm, when I'm working with that utility and what I don't need to do with that utility. So let's take a look at the electric grid as our example. Um, so suppose it's winter and it's get, starting to get cold. And you know when it starts getting cold can vary from one year to another, but I have a bunch of electric heaters sitting around my house. And... When it starts getting cold, I plug in my electric heaters into the wall and I crank them up. Um, I don't notify the electric company when I need more electricity. The electric company just has a whole bunch of electricity. Uh, hopefully it doesn't run out, which as we've seen does occasionally happen. But uh, generally speaking, there's a lot of electricity there. I just plug my uh, devices into the wall. I plug my heaters into the wall and I start using them. I don't call up the electric company ahead of time and I say, Hey, you know, um, it's starting to get cold. I think starting next Thursday, I'm going to need some more electricity. Can you add a bit of extra electricity to my bill? And then if, if I use it, great. And if I don't, well, I guess I'm going to have to pay for it because I told you to increase my electric uh, output. You know, that doesn't happen, right? You just take your heater, you plug it into the wall, and it goes. Um, and I definitely don't, have to go to the store to increase my electric capacity. I don't go to the store. I don't think, hey, it's winter. I hear it's going to be a really cold winter this year. I need to buy a whole bunch of generators. I'm going to go to the store, get those generators, or maybe I'll, I'll tell Amazon, send me some generators over, get them set up, you know, get my whole uh, little house grid set up. You know, I don't do any of that. This is all taken care of for me. I just plug things into the wall and stuff is just there for me. And when it starts heating up again, when it's spring, I don't need my uh, heaters anymore. I don't call the electric company and say, hey, I, I, I don't think I need the heaters anymore, so please reduce my bill. Um, I, I don't need those anymore. And then uh, it's summer, same thing. You know, So my usage goes up and down depending upon the season. 
Um, and I don't notify the electric company. I don't need to make any special moves. The electricity is just there at the wall when I need it. And so that's the whole idea behind utility computing and grid computing. The idea is just like the electricity is there when I need it, just like the water is there when I open up the tap, um, it's just a widely available good that's managed by this external utility company. Uh, the idea behind grid computing or utility computing is the exact same thing except for, for computing power. There's computing power, it's available on demand. I can scale up or scale down as I need. If we happen to have, uh, you know, we're running a bunch of simulations in February, uh, we need more computing power. We don't need to notify anybody we need more computing power. We just, you know, plug into the wall and that computing power is there for us. Um, I don't need to determine my needs in advance and I can scale up and scale down as needed. When we're done running those simulations, it's February, let's say mid-March, we're done running those simulations. We don't need so much computing power anymore. We don't tell anybody, we just stop using it and we stop paying for it the same way when I stopped uh, running my space heaters, I stopped paying for the electricity. So, you know, this is the idea behind uh, utility or grid computing. This is what we're really shooting for. So let's kind of compare these two models. And, you know, one of the big benefits of having utility or a grid model is that there's just a huge, tremendous amount of flexibility and agility that it gives businesses. Because under the traditional model, uh, I need to determine my needs in advance. I need to uh, contract with a supplier who's going to supply me with actual computing devices. I need to wait for them to get delivered. Uh, I need to install them. You know, this all takes advanced forecasting. Under the utility or grid model, I don't worry about what we need in advance. It's just there and available for me. And under the traditional model, if we overestimate, well, we've got a whole bunch of servers that we paid for. And we spent all this time installing and getting set up. And we don't need them because we didn't have as much demand for our product as we wanted. Under the utility or grid model, if we don't have the demand we thought we might have, that's kind of unfortunate, but at least we aren't stuck with these extra servers sitting around. We only get what, we're, uh, what we need um, and we only pay for what is actually used. If we underestimate under the traditional model, we're gonna have to turn away our customers. We're gonna say, all right, um, that's great, you wanna use our service. We're gonna order some more servers. Uh, we might have more capacity in a couple of days. You'll have to wait till then. Under the utility or grid model, that power is just available for us. If we need more power, great, more power is available. All right, another big advantage of the grid or utility model is the computers aren't actually located at my company. So under the traditional model, if I have uh, something that, you know, it's important that we provide proper security for it, I'm responsible for providing the security. Under the utility grid model, the cloud computing company provides the security. Uh, under the traditional model, if I'm concerned that I need good uptime on this, uh, I need to have backup electric power so that if the power goes out, uh, my generators get turned on. Under the utility grid model, that's the responsibility of the cloud computing company. Um, under the traditional model, if I'm concerned about uh, you know, having multiple geographic locations because heaven forbid if the power goes out in California and somebody tries to access it and our computers are in California, well, we've got kind of a problem there. Or if the network in California is having a problem, we have, kind of have a problem. So. You know, we might want to have our computing devices in multiple geographic locations. And under the traditional model, I'm going to have to go rent those buildings in multiple geographic locations. I'm going to have to have personnel at those different locations to keep track and support these computers. Under the utility grid model, the cloud computing company has lots of different locations. And, um, you know, that's great. And not only does it support support uh, this idea that if, if one of the centers has problems, if there's a power outage somewhere or a network outage somewhere, uh, I've got multiple locations so I, my customers can continue to access it. It also provides lower latency because, you know, if, if I have uh, stuff at the Amazon services in uh, Washington state, um, and I also have them out in Virginia. If somebody's trying to access my stuff from the East Coast, well, we can route them through the Virginia server and they'll have much less uh, latency. Um, they'll get the data back, back much faster because they're, they're closer located. And that goes even further when we're talking about 
situations where we have international customers. If I have a server in Australia uh, and somebody's access from Australia, that's going to get them much faster access. Okay, so as I suggested earlier when we started this, modern cloud computing doesn't yet have all the things that we were hoping for with utility or grid computing, but we're getting pretty close. We're going to take a look at four different cloud computing models. Infrastructure as a service, sometimes referred to as IaaS. Platform as a service, referred to as PaaS. Serverless. And then software as a service, referred to as SaaS. Under infrastructure as a service, the provider is going to provide the basic computer infrastructure. Um, and I, as the customer, am going to organize the infrastructure as needed. So this is an example here. Amazon Web Services has virtual private cloud. And by the way, um, I should mention Amazon Web Services by itself is a huge company with a very wide range of product options. So if somebody tells you they're using Amazon Web Services AWS, that doesn't really tell you what they're doing. You need to know which specific service they're using on AWS. Um, so the virtual private cloud service, VPC, um, the way this would work is our company would contract for a given number of Amazon EC2 instances. Uh, these are elastic cloud instances. Um, and so these are basically virtual machines. Um, our IT professionals would set up these EC2 instances with whatever operating systems we wanted on them. Um, and we would set up our network structure between these EC2 instances. We could set up some of the EC2 instances as sort of internal uh, to our own virtual private cloud where uh, outsiders couldn't have direct access to them. And then we could set some of the EC2 instances as externally visible as sort of public things that different people could access. And so, so what we're seeing here is we have a bunch of computers. They are up on the cloud, but we need to do the setup ourselves. And so what we get out of IS is it's similar to having your own computers, except for it's much easier to add and remove instances as needed. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if we're following the traditional model, if we need more computers, we need to order those computers. Those computers need to be physically delivered to our premises. We need to set them up and we need to get everything installed. With infrastructure as a service, if we need more instances, we just go to our little web page on Amazon uh, AWS, and I crank up the number of instances we need, and bang, I instantly have a whole bunch more instances. Now, um, not only is it better because I can scale up and scale down as needed with just a click of a button, but again, as we talked about earlier, uh, Amazon is likely going to have better security than we are going to have on our own unless, you know, I mean, if I'm a really large company or the government, I suppose I could get really good security. But, you know, if you're a small size company or a mid sized company, Amazon's going to have better security. It's going to have probably better network access. It's going to have better electric system reliability. And they have centers all around the world. So not only do we scale up and down very easily, but, uh, a lot of the sort of nitty gritty of making sure that everything's up, we have good uptime, we have a secure system, uh, that's all completely taken care of. So that's great. Um, that's a big load off of us. But at the same time, uh, with IS, I still need a extensive, highly trained IT staff. We are maintaining and updating our own servers um, as if they were on the local premises even though they're actually on the cloud. So we're handling all the maintenance, we're handling all the updates, we're doing all the setup, we're doing all the normal IT stuff. The big difference is they are not on the physical premise, they are up on the cloud. And again, we can, uh, we can add and remove them as needed very, very easily. Okay, so that's, um, that's not looking so much like the computing grid, uh, that's, that's not looking so much like the utility or grid computing that I promised. Uh, there are some, some, some benefits such as easily increasing or decreasing the instances, but you can see that uh, I am managing a lot. I have an IT staff that is handling a lot of the stuff. And so there's some pretty clear benefits of using IaaS in terms of the advantage over having physically on premise. But in addition, um, you know, you may be like, well, why would you want to have your own IT staff doing it? Well, I can set up these computers in any way I want. So now I'm getting some of the key benefits of having stuff up on the cloud, uh, being able to scale up and down about not needing to forecast that much in advance. 
uh, about not needing to provide security, et cetera, et cetera. But I still have the complete flexibility as if these were my own computers. All right, platform as a service. So a platform as a service, the computing platform is provided for me. My company is only responsible for the application software running on that platform. So Heroku and Amazon Elastic Beanstalk are examples of pass. And so here's another AWS service, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. Um, so you know, there's there's going to be differences between the different pass models, but let's say we're using Heroku. So I'm going to go ahead and write my application in one of the languages that Heroku supports. So maybe I use JavaScript Node.js, or maybe I use Ruby or PHP. You know, they have a bunch of different languages that they support. I store my code using Git, which is a version control system. And when I'm ready, I tell Git to send my code to Heroku, and my code is now live on the internet. So you know, with Heroku, I'm not setting up my own network. I'm mostly not configuring my own computers, uh, which is what we saw on IaaS. Uh, I don't have access to a lot of the aspects of the operating system. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not setting up the interconnections between a bunch of EC2 instances. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is taken care of. I'm able to focus much more on just what my application is doing. This gives me less flexibility, but it makes things a lot, lot easier for me to deal with. Um, I can choose to add some extra instances. So, you know, if I, if I decide I need more power, I can go ahead and do that. And there are some options that I can configure. So it's not like there's no configuration at all. I can decide whether I want databases. Uh, there's a bunch of other add-on packages I can pay extra money for. But for the most part, like, this is super simple compared to infrastructure as a service where I install the operating system on these virtual machines. I get all my virtual instances uh, and the virtual private cloud. I get them all configured. Like, so there's much less need for uh, IT staff with platform as a service. Mostly, I just put my application onto the instance and Heroku takes care of the rest. Okay, our next model is serverless, and this is getting much more towards what uh, utility and grid computing had, had intended. Basically, I don't have any virtual computing instances. Instead, I just have, hey, here's a function I want to run. Um, and so the best example of this would be Amazon Lambda. This is another AWS service. So again, lots of uh, Amazon Web Services types of services. So you know, again, if somebody says we're using AWS, you need to know exactly which the many, many services of AWS are using. So in Amazon Lambda, I write a function that I want to call remotely. I upload the function code to Amazon, and then I call that function remotely as needed, and I just pay for however many computing resources get used by somebody calling that function over the month, and they just send me the bill at the end of the month. So um, very much like the original uh, grid computing model. Uh, you know, I, I don't configure anything. I don't uh, need to determine how many instances I want. Um, I certainly don't figure out, you know, what operating systems I want or deal with operating system patches. I'm just like, hey, here's a bunch of code. Whenever I call this code, just go ahead and run it for me. So that's actually pretty cool. All right, our last model is software as a service. This one's a little bit different. It doesn't really fit in with the other models because um, in the previous models, you certainly wouldn't have an end customer. You know, but like if I'm Joe customer, I am not going to sign up for infrastructure as a service. I'm not going to sign up for platform as a service, and I'm not going to sign up for serverless. But I certainly might sign up for software as a service. And in fact, most of us use software as a service at some point or another. So software as a service means a company is providing software to other people as a service. Typically, that software will be mostly run on the provider's computers, although, as we saw in our discussion of client-side versus server-side processing, in most of these cases, there will be a client-side component. So uh, when we go, and this is, this is typically going to be, this will often be uh, done in conjunction with the web, and we, when we go visit the website, it's going to go ahead and send us a client-side program. So Technically, some of the software as a service will be running on the client side computer, but uh, this is generally considered as this is being handled by the uh, the company providing the software as a service. This is being run by their computers. And so, an example of software as a service is Google Docs. So, 
Google is providing software uh, up on the web and people are visiting the Google website and taking advantage of that, um, of Google Docs. So advantages of software as a service for customers. Um, the IT department does not have to deal with anything. So if you've got a whole bunch of people in your company, many of who you know, are not tech people who may not be exercising the best uh, security, installing random games on their computers, um, you know, that's kind of a concern. And so you need a tech department that's keep, keeping track of everything, trying to make sure that their version of Microsoft Word or whatever does not get infected or anything. Well, with software as a service, all the stuff is on on the uh, the provider's website, uh, on the provider's servers, and your IT company doesn't have to deal with it. Um, if there's a update, if Google Docs gets updated, for example, um, and I go visit the Google Docs website, I am using the latest version of the software. Um, if they've changed the client side uh, code, that's going to get automatically updated. When I go visit that website, it's going to get sent from the server to my web browser, and I, I will always be running the latest version of the code. Um, another advantage is this software is usually designed for the network in mind because it's always designed to be always running on the network. And so these pieces of software will often have more collaborative features built in than traditional software. So um, you can see this with Google Docs, which has lots of nice features that uh, that different people on the team can sort of work together. Uh, Microsoft is trying to add these features in, but you know, traditionally Microsoft Word or Excel was not designed to have multiple people accessing it simultaneously. And whereas Google Docs has always had in mind that this is running on the internet. And so um, that's the sort of design choices they can make while the initially designing the software. Um, as far as somebody that's providing this service, there's a number of big benefits as well. And so one of the nice things about software as a service is it often requires a subscription, which means you have a steady stream of income, which is always nice. Um, in addition, uh, if you're running something that has software as a service, you're much less concerned with copy protection because people don't run it on their own. They run it by visiting your server. And so you can keep track of people's uh, logins. And if, if they want to log into the server, you can check, are they paying customer or not? Whereas with traditional software, somebody can make a duplicate copy, install it on a different computer, um, install it on a whole bunch of other people's computers, even though they haven't paid for it. So um, software as a service has advantages both as a customer where, uh, you know, your IT department doesn't have to worry about keeping everything upgraded uh, and up to date and installed on everybody's computer. And then it has benefits to the provider uh, as well. Okay, so... Uh, we've been talking about cloud computing. Um, there's actually another set of uh, models of computing associated with running on the network, but uh, separate from the cloud. And so there's a number of different terms. These are all somewhat interrelated. So edge computing, fog computing, or mesh computing. And so the difference between edge, fog, and mesh computing versus cloud computing is typically we think of the cloud as somewhere out far away on the internet. But for some types of applications and some application architectures, we may want to distinguish between things that are far away on the internet, meaning cloud computing, versus things that are nearby, but not on our device. Uh, so somewhere nearby on a nearby network or on our current network uh, versus stuff that is physically on our own device. Um, and so Here's the nuances between edge, fog, and mesh computing. Edge computing is referring to the edge between the internet and our own device. So it's like, again, nearby. Fog computing is similar. Uh, the main term fog computing was meant as a contrast to cloud computing, where again, cloud is considered far away on the internet. And then mesh computing um, focuses on having more decentralized networks that may possibly form in an ad hoc manner uh, and uh, provides for more robust networks. And we'll talk about this in a couple minutes why you, why you might want this. Okay, so what's the benefits of edge, fog, or mesh computing versus cloud computing? Well, consider working in a remote environment. So to provide an example, I found those examples on GE Digital. I thought this was a great example. Uh, you've got an offshore platform. So you've got, a, you know, you're, you're drilling for oil out in the middle of the Gulf. 
Um, yes, maybe you do have a connection to the internet, but you have limited connection to the internet, possibly slower, but also limited bandwidth. And so, and so edge or fog computing sort of focuses on this idea that, Hey, you know, we can handle some things internally on our network here, uh, on our offshore platform. And then we can also talk to the cloud depending upon what we're doing. So it's, it does, we want to distinguish between stuff that we're handling locally within our internet here on the offshore platform versus what's happening uh, further out. And then, uh, you know, hopefully soon we will have similar issues in space where, you know, maybe you've got a bunch of people on the moon. Um, they can still communicate with Earth, but, you know, they have limited bandwidth and they certainly have a huge latency uh, when trying to communicate with the Earth. And then, of course, Mars would have even bigger issues. So the idea here is the closer we are to the device, um, you know, we've got stuff going on in the local closer network, uh, either the local network or, you know, we might have our own little intranetwork. Um, you, know, you can imagine on Mars, we've got our own little intranetwork. It's, we've got a bunch of networks, a network of networks, but then uh, we're, we are largely separated from the internet on Earth. Okay, so uh, we're going to have reduced bandwidth requirements to the overall internet. So we've, we've got some local stuff, uh, our, our smaller network. Um, it does communicate with the larger internet, but we've got reduced bandwidth requirements. We're trying to keep the amount of bandwidth we need to send to the larger internet uh, to a minimum. We've got reduced latency. Again, uh, you know, it, depending upon where we're located and what our communications to the larger internet looks like, there could be a fairly big delay between when we send information off to the larger internet and when we get results back. And so this is actually one of the reasons why uh, some people are looking at this for cell phone usage. Um, the European telecommunication standard is working on edge computing. And the idea here is that they want to reduce the amount of traffic that goes over the cell phone towers. And so if they can handle some of the processing at the cell phone tower itself, they won't have to send the data any further. So uh, that's another potential use of edge or fog or mesh computing. Um, and some of these types of computing focus on trying to provide for more robust models. And so uh, this is particularly focused on mesh computing. Uh, what you want is you want a distributed computer model that does not have a single point of failure. So remember a while back, uh, probably about three, four weeks ago, when we were talking about how the network worked, I mentioned that one of the issues with the star network is you've got a central failure point. So uh, our example of uh, a star network that we all use is the Wi-Fi network. If the Wi-Fi router goes down, we're all hosed. And so the idea behind a mesh network is you want to have a more robust uh, model where if one of the nodes goes down, you can keep on working. So self-healing network if some of the nodes are lost. Um, and as you might imagine, these type of designs are particularly important for military applications. So, you know, if you've got that command vehicle and it is the central point of failure and something happens to it, uh, you don't want the whole network to go down. You still want people to be able to communicate with each other and still um, maintain network connectivity. And so uh, for some people working in this area, um, this is a key key issue that they're trying to look into and trying to create robust mesh computing. One thing I do want to mention is that this does not replace cloud computing necessarily, and that it can often be done in conjunction with traditional cloud computing. So handle some requests at the edge, and then pass additional requests onto the cloud. Um, this also often involves devices other than traditional computers. And um, this brings us to the Internet of Things, which is actually what our next video is going to be talking about. So I will talk to you about the Internet of Things shortly.